Okay, welcome everyone to today's event, Neurodiversity and Intersectionality, a virtual series hosted by the Rowan University Center for Neurodiversity. The Center for Neurodiversity is a cultural center within Rowan's Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion with two aims, to situate neurodiversity in our DEI initiatives and to provide programs and events that value and prioritize neurodiversity culture. My name is Amy Accardo, and we are honored and thrilled that our speaker today is Dr. Nick Walker, especially as her work has been foundational to our center development, to our learning and professional development around neurodiversity on campus. And we're thrilled that you're all here to engage in continuous learning about neurodiversity with us. First, I'd like to turn it over to Esther Baumgartner. Esther is a PhD candidate working with the center and Esther is going to provide a land acknowledgement and session procedures. Hi, everyone. First, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of the lands that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment to improving relationships among nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Please join me. As a settler here in southern New Jersey, I acknowledge the land of the Lenni Lenape Nation. If you'd like to share your acknowledgement in the chat, please do so. Thank you. In terms of procedures, we would like to encourage choice of video on or off and encourage all ways of being and participating. Please note this session is being recorded and staying in this session is consent to being recorded. Dr. Nick Walker will provide a talk related to the theme of neurodiversity and intersectionality for the first half of our time. Then we will move into a Q&A facilitated by two of our student leaders for the second half of our session. Do feel free to place questions in the chat at any time, or if you prefer your questions to be anonymous, we also have a slider link that we'll place in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Now I'd like to take a moment and introduce our student leaders. Terry Nguyen is a co-president of our campus Neurodiversity Club. Terry majors in both music and biomedical visualization and art with a specialization in graphic design. Terry, if you want to give everyone a hello. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. And Addie Achterberg is a member of our Center for Neurodiversity Student Advisory Board. Addie is a College of Performing Arts student majoring in musical theater with a minor in international studies. Hi. Thanks, Addie. And now I'm going to turn it over to Addie, and she is going to introduce Nick Walker. Uh, Dr. Nick Walker is a queer, transgender, flamingly autistic writer and educator, best known for her foundational work on the neurodiversity paradigm and neuroqueer theory. She's a professor of psychology at California Institute of Integral Studies, senior Aikido instructor at the Aiki Arts Center in Berkeley, and author of the book Neuroqueer Heresies, Notes on the Neurodiversity Paradigm, Autistic Empowerment, and Postnormal Possibilities. Thank you, Dr. Walker, and we're ready to begin whenever you are. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. I grew up in New Jersey, so it's great to be speaking to folks in New Jersey. Yeah, I'm over on the West Coast now. It's earlier here. Hi, everybody. So let's see. Um, got invited to give this talk on neurodiversity and intersectionality. And I'll start with uh, this concept of uh, the neurodiversity paradigm. So uh, way back in the 1990s, um, autistic, there was a growing autistic rights movement and a growing uh, emerging autistic community and culture, which is still growing and still emerging. But back in the 90s, uh, there were these early discussions of uh, how, how does this work? How does this idea of autistic civil rights work? What is the nature of our oppression or marginalization? How do we understand what we're pushing back against and drawing on uh, other civil rights movements and other uh, the experiences of other oppressed communities and saying, well, how does this or doesn't this apply to our own? Uh, what sort of minority are we? We're clearly uh, a marginalized minority group, but what does that mean? We're not an ethnic minority. You know, autism is not an ethnicity, just autistic people of every ethnicity. Uh, what are we? And so 
this concept of uh, neurodiversity emerged, uh, that we are a, a neuro minority group. And this concept that, okay, just as humanity is ethnically diverse and culturally diverse and diverse in terms of gender and sexuality, uh, we're also a neurodiverse species, a neurodiverse uh, people. And the, the, same, uh, the same dynamics occur around neurodiversity that they do around other forms of diversity. And so this was, uh, we had first this concept of neurodiversity, uh, which emerged in the mid nineties uh, among autistic uh, activists. And then from there, uh, so neurodiversity was being talked about as a framework, as a way of seeing things. And it was getting confusing because there's neurodiversity you know, neurodiversity is a biological fact. Humans are uh, neurologically, neurocognitively diverse species, just like we have diversity in terms of how different people are different heights or have different fingerprints or different eye colors. So uh, to, clear, to make it clearer, I developed this term, the neurodiversity paradigm. And the idea was, okay, there's neurodiversity, which is, the biological fact that there's enormous variation in neurocognitive functioning from person to person. And then there's this neurodiversity paradigm, which is a particular framework for looking at neurodiversity. So I, I published this essay eventually um, uh, in, or I guess wrote it in 2010, 2011, first published in 2012, this essay called Throw Away the Master's Tools, Liberating Ourselves from the Pathology Paradigm. And my thesis there was that the current way that neurodiversity is dealt with within the dominant culture and society is what I call a pathology paradigm. And the premises of the pathology paradigm are a one that there's there is one normal or right or healthy way for a human mind to function. And two, that if you diverge from that normal too much, you are, uh, there's something wrong with you. You're suffering from a disorder or an illness or a condition. And so that's the pathology paradigm. And it serves to, to marginalize and oppress neuro-minority groups the same way that the concept of a master race uh, serves to oppress ethnic minorities and racialized minority groups, or the same way that the idea of the gender binary as normal and natural uh, serves, to, uh, serves to oppress gender and sexual minorities. So, uh, so the, the pathology paradigm, that's the pathology paradigm, the neurodiversity paradigm, the neurodiversity paradigm, as I proposed it, had the premise first that there's no such thing as a normal mind, that there's just culturally constructed and culturally variable concepts of normal and a culturally imposed normativity. And this is the same as the culturally imposed heteronormativity, culturally imposed gender binary, or as uh, culturally imposed, uh, you know, racist values and colonialist values. So uh, no normal mind, that's a cultural fiction, no one right or natural way for the human body mind to function neurocognitively. And then also this idea that uh, neurodiversity functions in terms of its dynamics, it functions similarly to other axes of human diversity. So we look at say ethnicity, ethnic diversity as an axis of human diversity and gender as an axis of human diversity and sexual orientation and uh, culture and all of these various as uh, um, ability, disability, 
uh, these various axes of diversity that intersect with each other in and interact in various ways, thus this concept of intersectionality. And so neurodiversity, I said, was an axis of diversity and similar dynamics occurred with neurodiversity in terms of uh, particular dominant groups presenting themselves as the normal or natural or right way to be and presenting other people as uh, inferior for being different from them. So that's the neurodiversity paradigm and that's become a uh, foundation to emerging uh, concepts of neurodiversity and emerging field of neurodiversity studies, emerging discourse on, on neurodiversity. Um, what I've been playing with lately uh, in expanding on, on that is particularly uh, a two, di two different things. One is this notion of neurocosmopolitanism and the other is what I'm calling neuroqueer theory. So uh, neurocosmopolitanism is an extension of this idea of cosmopolitanism. And the idea of cosmopolitanism is cosmopolitanism is a way of dealing with uh, and relating to cultural diversity. So cultural diversity exists, it's a thing. And the, the sort of standard attitude that we find uh, among uh, the narrow-minded is around cultural diversity is what's called provincialism. And provincialism is, well, the way that I was raised to think and behave is natural. And everyone else is savages or barbarians or exotic or just somehow different, right? I don't have an accent. Everybody else in the world has a funny accent. The way I talk is normal. And so that's the provincial attitude where the person's uh, only lens for looking at things is one where uh, their culture is assumed to be normal, their, where their own cultural experience is like a pair of lenses over their eyes that they don't know they're wearing and they can't take off. Cosmopolitanism is the opposite of provincialism. Cosmopolitanism is the idea that there's no normal culture or superior culture. There's just culture. Everyone's got their particular cultural experience in every region and ethnicity and uh, group. There's cultures and subcultures. There's this enormous cultural variation everywhere. Everyone's part of the spectrum of human cultural diversity and embrace it all. Instead of sticking to this idea that one's own culture is the normal culture, be like, oh, okay, well, I learned this particular way and all of these other ways are interesting and developed for reasons and have other things to offer and let me learn and engage with them respectfully with an attitude of humility rather than a sense of cultural superiority. So it's like an opposite of provincialism, an opposite of colonialism, an opposite of like, oh, I, uh, these cultures are different from mine. So I have a, a divine imperative to step on them and force my ways on them. Instead, no, let me engage with humility and respect and uh, engage in this cultural synergy and cultural hybridity. Oh, let me teach you my ways and learn your ways. And oh, look at this, look what happened when we put this together. You know, when we put, you start putting things together from different cultures, you start getting fascinating developments in everything from cuisine to music, to literature, to dance, to science. So uh, that's cosmopolitanism and neurocosmopolitanism is extending this idea of cosmopolitanism to neurodiversity to saying, well, okay, everybody has their own unique mode of neurocognitive functioning and their own unique uh, sensory cognitive experience and mind and ways of conducting 
ourselves that emerge from what our sensory and cognitive experience is, ways of moving, ways of embodiment, ways of being a self and experiencing the world and communicating. And to, to say that there's one default, normal, natural way of, to be a human body mind and to cognitively process things, well, that is, uh, that's neuroprovincialism. It's the neurodiversity's equivalent of provincialism. And so I'm, uh, this idea I'm putting forth is that uh, the end goal of the neurodiversity paradigm is, uh, is neurocosmopolitanism is this idea that we all should uh, Im not just embrace neurodiversity in the sense of acceptance of neuro-minority groups, but in the sense of embracing neurodiversity as a uh, beauty and as a source of creative synergy and hybridity. And it's at this point fairly well established through research and such that uh, diverse groups generate, uh, generate better solutions. There's a, an intelligence in diversity, what philosopher Edgar Morin calls the genius of diversity. Uh, there's an, uh, and you'll see uh, in my book, there's a, there's a epic, one of the epigraphs from one of the, the first section of the book, this is Edgar Moran uh, quote, uh, diver, uh, what is it, this Edgar Moran quote, homogeneity lacks genius. And so I'm all about the genius of diversity and that's well established in terms of like uh, gender diverse groups where you have mixed gender representation uh, will tend to generate more creative solutions than uh, an equivalent group that's, you know, gender homogenous. It's like all cisgender men, uh, ethnically diverse groups, culturally diverse groups. Just there's a genius to putting together different perspectives in a respectful way where they hybridize. And same thing with neurodiversity. You get a neurodiverse group together where you get multiple, you know, you've got just multiple different neurocognitive styles represented. Everyone is accommodated in uh, being themselves and respectfully looking for how do we communicate with each other across our different perspectives and experiences and modes of expression. And what you get is the genius of diversity really dramatically amplified. And this works, um, you know, I've seen it work myself on like a classroom level academically, works on a classroom level or a campus wide level or a cultural community wide level, or I expect on a, society level, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's scalable on any scale, diversity when embraced and uh, engaged with intentionally, uh, creatively becomes this source of genius in uh, 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 the sense of not of the individual genius, but the communal genius. So that's one thing I'm working on. I think there's a, <laughs> um, there's like a uh, um, a distorted, ugly version of the beauty of neurocosmopolitanism that's emerging these days in corporate culture, where uh, where they're looking at how do we exploit neurodiversity as a resource, but it's not about respectful engagement. It's about like, how do we exploit autistic labor? You know, ooh, autistic people, some autistic people have good minds for software engineering. And maybe because it's uh, hard for them to find employment, we can pay them less and call this a neurodiversity initiative. You can always tell these people because they misuse the word neurodiverse. They talk about neurodiverse people, which there's no such thing as a neurodiverse person because an individual can't be diverse. Diversity is a property of groups. What you want is a neurodiverse company, a neurodiverse organization 
where uh, neurodivergent people are represented and included uh, on every level, including the, the policy making levels. And that becomes more neurocosmopolitan there rather than this idea of uh, neurodiversity as referring to uh, uh, certain pathologized neuro-minority groups and how can we exploit uh, these neuro-minority groups. Neurodiversity is every human being is part of the spectrum of human neurodiversity. We're a neurodiverse species made up of many, many different varieties of neurodivergence and neurocosmopolitanism is, okay, let's embrace it all. Maybe eventually this concepts of neurotypicality and neurodivergence uh, vanish in, in the long run because it's just, oh, okay, we're all, we're all different. And in this is uh, the beauty and creative strength of human neurodiversity. So that's one aspect that I'm focused on these days in my work. And the other is what I call neuroqueer theory, which ex is an extension of queer theory to into the realm of neurodiversity. And so uh, queer theory 101, um, binary heterosexual, male, female gender roles as, as they're taught are not natural. If they were natural and normal, they would not uh, have to be uh, so, so brutally imposed, right? So much goes, work goes into imposing, instilling and enforcing uh, binary heteronormative a gender performance and it wouldn't take that much work if it were actually natural for people. So uh, queer theory has this idea, okay, there's not normal gender, heteronormativity is not a normal thing. It is a culturally constructed then shifting this endlessly shifting, evolving pervasive standard of normativity, heteronormativity is like this, this whole cultural complex of binary masculine, feminine gender roles and how do you do them? How do you embody yourself in every way, like whatever gender you were assigned to, male or female, based on the shape of the genitals you were born with? And then, uh, uh, you know, heterosexuality is part of that binary gender role performance. And, how everyone is supposed to do it. And <clears throat> so the idea that this is a learned performance is central to queer theory. And that these are performance, not in the sense of theater, but in the sense uh, that these are things we perform, that gender is not something we are intrinsically, but something that we do and that we learn to do and often are forced to do in particular ways. And so that performance, that heteronormative performance can be queered, which means it can be creatively messed with and customized and subverted and deviated from and challenged in all sorts of ways. One can liberate oneself from heteronormative performance and alter how one embodies gender and how one does gender and sexuality. And this is queering, this is the act of queering and so uh, two premises to neuroqueer theory. And the first is that uh, neuronormativity works like heteronormativity. Nobody is born neurotypical. There's no neurotypical brain. There's no normal brain. There's just learned performance of normativity. People are taught this is the way, this is the way to think and embody. And it's a way that's more or less compatible with the way a majority of people function neurocognitively. Doesn't mean that it's not a restrictive box for everyone in certain ways. And neuronormativity, like heteronormativity, because it's a learned performance, can be queered. 
one can tamper with that performance. And that works if one is a neuro minority, you know, if one is autistic, like one can queer neuronormativity by insisting on moving and communicating and thinking and interacting with the world like an autistic person and not trying to imitate non-autistic person. But also, you don't have to be born autistic or a member of some other uh, neuro minority group to neuroqueer. It's something anyone can do. Anyone can choose to abandon neuronormativity and alter their consciousness through all manner of practices and alter how they embody that consciousness. That's the first premise of neuroqueer theory. The second is that neuronormativity doesn't just uh, mirror heteronormativity, but is inseparable from heteronormativity, that in fact the two are inextricably entwined with each other. That if you look at what it means to impose heteronormative performance, it's also in a position of neuronormative performance and vice versa. So for instance, uh, autistic children these days uh, are frequently subjected to this abusive conversion therapy called ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, which is aimed at uh, forcing them to imitate non-autistic children. But, and, and ABA's roots are entwined with the roots of gay conversion therapy. Uh, they're, you know, it's really essentially the same thing, the same, exactly the same approach to uh, trying to condition people into normativity. And when one attempts, when, when the uh, you know, ABA practitioners are attempting to enforce normative performance on autistic children, it's always heteronormative performance. They're never telling parents, oh, don't worry, we'll turn your child into a perfectly normal queer child. It's always heteronormative performance along with neuronormative performance because they're inseparable. Neuronormativity is a tongue twister. Neuronormativity and heteronormativity are really just two facets of the same thing. Both are pervasive. And when you know, you're a little kid and people are telling you to act normal, they mean both neuronormative and heteronormative. And this means that when you are queering neuronormativity, you're also queering heteronormativity and vice versa. You diverge from neuronormativity far enough and you're also queering your heter heteronormativity and uh, vice versa. So those are these concepts that I've been playing with, starting with this neurodiversity paradigm, um, you know, that's, uh, quite, you know, quite old and well-developed now and has become the foundation for a lot of work and scholarship, but now playing with, okay, neurocosmopolitanism is sort of a, a, a goal to aim for, an attitude to cultivate in ourselves and in the broader culture, and then neuroqueer theory and who knows where that could go. So, mm -hmm. So in terms of intersectionality, we have this idea of <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the cosmopolitan attitude, how neurodiversity and cultural diversity uh, play with each other and interact and serve to uh, boost the genius of diversity for humanity. We have this idea of the neurodiversity paradigm and neurodiversity as an axis of diversity that intersects and has in, intersects with uh, other axes of diversity, gender diversity and ethnic diversity and such. And then we have this neuroqueer theory idea, which is very focused particularly on the intersection of uh, neurodiversity with gender sexual diversity. So that's what I'm playing with. And I'm at that, that exciting 30 minute mark where we're gonna make the transition to Q&A. So let's go for that.
Thank you so much. Very um, insightful. And we have some questions coming into the chat and also to the Slido. So Addie and Terry, Esther and I will copy them into the chat for you. Okay, I guess that means I should look at the chat. Let's so the, see. The Let's... students will read them out to you. Now. Oh, okay, that's great because boy, there's a lot in the chat. I just, <laughs> I just sit here and be fascinated and read and forget to answer the questions. So I think, yeah, just, just tell me the questions you don't want me to answer. Yeah, um, the first question I see from, from Jonathan is, in your view, are there other intersecting identities that are also queered in this process? Um, yeah, I think I would say, I would say definitely, I would say it's all, in a sense, all aspects of identity are entwined. And that's part of the original idea, um, you know, Kimberly, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's original idea of intersectionality was that, you know, her experience, you know, as a, a Black woman was different from the experience of a white woman or a black man, like her experience as a a, a, a gender minority and her experience as a, a, a racialized minority were not separate things, but they intersected in that the black woman's experience in America was fundamentally qualitatively different because the intersections, uh, the intersection uh, of cultural experience and intersecting oppressions produce something entirely different in terms of how a person experienced life and their positionality in the world. Um, and I think that speaks to, you know, my work is less focused these days on intersecting oppressions and more about creative shaping of identities, but, and creative shaping of cultures. But I think that that uh, Crenshaw's initial point about intersectionality really is absolutely essential that every aspect of one's identity intersects and informs the other aspects. And so, yeah, I would say if you queer one, you one aspect, you're querying every aspect of your identity in various ways and what it means, um, you know, because all of these performances, all of these performances of identity and culture are pervasive in the sense that they inform everything you do. So, uh, you know, the, the whiteness imposed by white supremacy and colonialism is uh, a particular performance of how you're supposed to conduct yourself and speak and such. And so, and it's a heteronormative performance and a neuronormative performance. And so you're querying that as well. You're querying, you're querying uh, the social, socially imposed racialized performances. Uh, you're querying your own cultural experience. You know, your every culture has its particular gender norms and they differ from each other. But if you're querying the gender norms, you're querying your whole performance of your culture because gender is, uh, entwined with every aspect of cultural performance. So, uh, you know, and perspective, every culture teaches particular perspectives and a wildly neurodivergent person in any culture is gonna have a different perspective from most people in their culture. And so leaning into that starts querying the entire cultural performance. So I guess that's a long way of saying yes, All right, thank you so much. Um, I have a question from Dr. Ricardo. Um, her question is, how is the pathology paradigm similar to or different than models of disability? Mm. Um, there is uh, There is a strong overlap. So the pathology paradigm, so let's, and I, I have a whole chapter about this actually in, in, in my book. So uh, I, I encourage one, people to read that if you want a more in-depth, complex uh, view on that. Um, uh, what's it called? I would call the chapter, I think, uh, uh, Neurodivergence and the Social Model of Disability, something like that. Anyway, two essential models of disability. The medical model of disability uh, locates disability in the individual and says, you know, you have a disability. You have, uh, you have a thing 
that is wrong with you. You have a disability and uh, you know, we'll, we'll need to treat it. This is a defect that, uh, that you have. So it medicalizes it. And uh, the social model of disability frames disability very differently. You don't have a disability, you are disabled. And so you may have impairments, that is certain things you can't do. You know, if you can not walk, you have an impairment. Plainly, there's a thing, there's a specific thing that many people can do, that the majority of people can do that you can't do, but you're, it's not intrinsically a disability. You're disabled to the extent that the social environment fails to accommodate you. So if you can't walk, you are more disabled in a place that discriminates against wheelchair users and uh, won't hire wheelchair users for jobs and doesn't build elevators and ramps, and you're less disabled in a place where wheelchair users are respected and accommodated. So disability is this contingent contextual thing located in the interaction between individual needs and abilities and societal accommodations, and which is more complex. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, the medical model is, is extremely reductionist. It's simplistic by just saying, oh, it's a defect in the person and not looking at all of the social surround. The social model takes us into know the context matters and disability is a function of the interaction between the needs of the person and the social context. So, um, so the social, the medical, the medical model of disability emphasizes uh, how will we treat your disability, and the uh, the social model of disability emphasizes how will we accommodate you so that you are less disabled and your participation is more enabled. It kind of it kind of uh, bugs me sometimes that people don't recognize a distinction that I'll see people say things like, well, is, you know, is autism a disability and have, you know, exciting internet flame wars about whether autism is a disability. Autism is not a disability and autistic people are disabled because autism is, you know, the degree to which an autistic person is disabled is dependent very much on how well they're accommodated and respected within the environment in which they find themselves. So you can't say that it's a disability located in the person, but you can definitely say autistic people are disabled. Very clearly, any autistic person will tell you that they are at a distinct disadvantage in most social environments because they're not accommodated. So that distinction between something being a disability and people being disabled is important and frequently not recognized. Um, clearly, clearly, the social model of disability is much more compatible with the neurodiversity paradigm. So generally speaking, yes, I would say the medical model of disability is very much entwined with the pathology paradigm and the social model very much entwined with the neurodiversity paradigm. Um, I will clarify that I'm not, I'm not opposed to pathologizing some forms of neurodivergence and treating them. And that's a common misconception of the neurodiversity paradigm um, is, is this idea that, oh, advocates of the neurodiversity paradigm think that no, no problems should ever be treated, you know, which is kind of a, a straw man argument there, plainly false. But autism, for instance, uh, it's pretty clear at this point, uh, just looking at the experiences of autistic people and the results that we're getting, that trying to cure people of being autistic uh, is harmful to them and does not benefit them. And trying to accommodate the needs of autistic people is much more beneficial. But let's look at PTSD. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that's a form of acquired neurodivergence. It very clearly alters neurocognitive functioning. And I am fully in favor of continuing to call it a disorder because 
it is a cause of distress and people who have it do not want it. You know, there's lots and lots of autistic people who are like, I would like my needs accommodated better, but I don't want to give up who I am and my basic perspective on the world. I have never met anyone with PTSD who's like, oh yeah, no, I'm really, I'm really psyched about this PTSD. Uh, that's just so uh, pathologizing PTSD in the sense of calling it, you know, calling it a disorder and looking for treatments, that seems like a, an actual useful application of a medical model and of, of uh, you know, how we, you know, this idea of treatment of the individual. That said, though, of course, people with PTSD who have not been treated for their PTSD uh, fully um, have needs that should also be accommodated. So the social model of disability is still relevant. Thank you. Um, we had a question anonymously um, asking, uh, did you have any significant personal experiences you can share that helped you to develop positive neurodivergent slash neuroqueer identity? Um, many, many, many uh, such experiences. I would say um, one of the biggest for me um, has been my Aikido training. I, uh, I've been practicing Aikido since I was 12 and I'm old now. Uh, so very long time, I've been teaching it since I was in my teens, uh, really through all my other various struggles and shifts of identity and uh, shifts of experience. You know, I mean, I was still finding ways to train while I was homeless in my twenties, um, just a lifetime immersed in this practice. And uh, Aikido as a, a martial art has a, 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 this distinctive approach of um, looking to transcend the, the whole fight flight dichotomy and contest of dominance and such. And so a lot of martial arts are just about how much ass can you kick? Who can you beat? How can you hit harder and faster? Aikido is very much about how can we take uh, the, the most stressful situation, you know, the most direct conflict situation, an actual direct physical attack, and turn that into something harmonious. How can we work with that creatively, remaining, remaining calm, cultivating serenity, and like, is there a place I can move in relation to the force of the attack coming at me that will turn this into the attacker being off balance and you know nobody having to get punched in the head. And so built into the physical practice is uh, this idea of looking for the opportunities for creative and graceful and positive solutions. And I think that that, um, you know, in terms of neuroqueering, like that's a neuroqueering practice. You know, 40 plus years of that has altered my brain for sure. And uh, altered my body, mind and how I function and like rewired me towards finding, uh, towards looking for creative solutions and looking for the positive and where is there room to evolve and where are the open spaces, looking at the solutions rather than the problems, not, oh my God, there's a fist coming at me, but oh, look at all of these open spaces I can move where the fist isn't going to be. And so, and how can we, you know, how can I turn this interaction into something more graceful and more positive. And so I've kind of wired myself through Aikido practice to think about everything that way. And that is a neuroqueering practice. And it does queer heteronormativity because of course, you know, I'm a trans woman, um, was, uh, you know, raised, you know, assigned male at birth, raised to be male. And so really taught uh, and deeply internalized um, you know, 
masculine ideas of conflict and machismo and, and uh, vying for dominance. And Aikido has been a wonderful antidote to that without which I might not have been able to, you know, as easily liberate myself from, from masculinity. Uh, but it is definitely queering in that way. It alters uh, because part of heteronormative performance is uh, how, we taught, how we're taught to deal with conflict depending on our assigned gender. And so Aikido has a way of, queer, of queering that for everyone. But uh, yeah, it's, um, I started out, I mean, I had a very traumatic childhood and I started out, uh, you know, really deeply negative, deeply depressed and deeply inclined to seeing the negative uh, in everything and looking at the problems. And I stayed that way for a very long time. It took a lot of years of Aikido practice for that to, to shift and really uh, took recognizing myself as trans for it to uh, fully shift. Uh, so, but that, uh, um, I, I really see it now because I look at, you know, other autistic people I encounter, um, you know, especially just being on social media and encountering autistic people there. And there's so many uh, traumatized autistic people who've really just learned to see the negative in everything. And it's uh, so much of the discourse around social justice or improving the situation of autistic people in the world. So much of it is just people bemoaning the problems and being depressed or angry uh, and always looking for the negative and everything. And I'm very much the opposite uh, these days, but I remember what it was like to be stuck in that. And it really has been uh, the Aikido practice that's been the foundation of turning that around for me. Thank you very much. Um, here is sort of a related question. Um, what are some actions you think that we can take as a university to develop our, um, to support the development of our neurodiverse um, identities, um, including those university students who are more comfortable with camouflaging? Um. Well, the ones who are comfortable with camouflaging are the easiest ones because they'll just camouflage. And, but it's the ones who don't want to camouflage, you know, the ones who are, uh, you know, who find it, uh, you know, who don't want, to, don't want to keep masking their natural embodiment and their natural self and want to neuroqueer and come out and uh, be themselves. I mean, you know, that's always... Uh, um, you know, that, that's always the group that's gonna have face the most challenges. It's hard uh, to do that in a hostile environment. And so what actions can be taken? Um, look at it, again, this neurocosmopolitanism idea, look at it as if you were looking at cultural diversity or racial diversity. So, you know, when you were, uh, when you're seeing, you know, uh, if you're, if you're, whether you're a student or faculty or administration, whatever, if you've got a student who is uh, um, not normal, you know, who is, who's embodied performance and way of thinking and communicating and interacting and such and their needs and all that are, are different from what your conception of normal is, recognize that that's an issue that you need to work on how to accommodate and uh, just the same way that you would if you were dealing with uh, ethnic diversity, racial diversity, cultural diversity. And so that's really, I would say, in terms of action, treat it the same way and take it seriously. Take it as, take it as seriously in terms of um, what would be the appropriate way to respond if this person were doing things very differently or communicating differently because of 
cultural, ethnic, natural, national, racial differences and treat it just as respectfully uh, if it, you know, uh, if it's due to some innate neurodivergence. And often you don't know because these things intersect. So it's like, you don't have to know exactly why a person's uh, style diverges from the norms, whatever norms you've internalized, you just have to respect it. So, and again, you know, I mean, people who choose to camouflage, well, they're choosing, you know, they're choosing to go along with the dominant norms to the best of their ability. They shouldn't have to, they should be able to, and they shouldn't have to. Thank you. Um, I think we're not gonna have time for every question, but I wanted to highlight one that stood out to me because uh, I relate as well. Um, there was a question in the chat, as a recently identified slash diagnosed autistic person and fairly new to advocacy, I still struggle with the occasional feelings of hopelessness when witnessing the constant stream of awful autism research, abusive practices, etc. I find that focusing on connecting with community and allies and not engaging too much with those who want to pathologize autism helps. Do you have any other tips for advocates or self-advocates trying to bring positive change to autism research and services? Yeah. Um be the change as the saying goes, you know, do um, uh, engage with and support the stuff that's good, but also help to create it. You know, you're in college, so this is, this is great. This is a start. I mean, there weren't out of the closet autistic scholars doing autism research, you know, when I was a kid. Now there's a lot. And do more, you know, I mean, one of the things that I do in my academic career is I sit on dissertation committees for people from, you know, schools all over the world. Um, I'll, I'll be the, the external member on a dissertation committee just so that, uh, you know, neuro-minority student can have uh, an advocate on their dissertation committee who understands what they're trying to do uh, with the work. And like, do that, you know, become the, become the next generation, uh, do the work that you wanna see exist and recognize that the support structures for that increasingly exist, that there are schools with, uh, you know, an intention to, there's, you know, I mean, this is, here's a university hosting this event, you know, that wouldn't have happened uh, 20 years ago. This, this conversation here wouldn't be happening sponsored by a university 20 years ago. And so the structures are there. Autistic academics like myself are there to like mentor and support and be on dissertation committees and that sort of thing. Um, and become part of the next generation of that. Uh, recognize that the support is there and become the part of the next generation that makes the support even more there. Um, and in terms of the bad, all the bad research, uh, don't, don't put up with it and don't hold back, like ridicule that garbage. Uh, it's, I mean, there's, uh, that stuff goes away. That's the amazing thing is that when better ideas come along, the old bad ones go away. It just takes time. You know, and Thomas Kuhn, who uh, um, you know, wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which introduced the whole idea of scientific paradigms, said, you know, most people don't have the mental flexibility to make a paradigm shift within their lifetime. So some people do. And then the next generation, people learn from those people. And eventually the people who wouldn't make the shift and are still stuck in the old paradigm just die off. And that takes a few generations for that shift to happen. And so we're just in the early stages of it that helps to take the long view in, in that sense. Um, but it does go away. Um, I mean, uh, you know, 120 years ago, it 
would have been inconceivable to anyone in the field of psychology that you could have a field of psychology without the concept of hysteria. But nobody gets diagnosed with hysteria anymore. Now we look at that and it just uh, seems sexist and silly. And when I was a kid, being gay, you know, homosexuality was, was in the DSM. Uh, homosexual paraphilia it was like a DSM diagnosis. You could be institutionalized for being gay. You know, uh, if you went to a therapist and you were gay, or you went to, you know, get support on a college campus for being gay, uh, they'd be like, oh, well, if we can just cure you of being gay, you'll be fine. That doesn't, like, I mean, that happens in like very right-wing places, but it's not a dominant paradigm. And if someone, you know, at your university, like teaching an abnormal psychology course, gave a lecture on uh, ways of curing gay people, they'd probably get a major administrative reprimand and people in the class would speak out about it and it would be a big deal. Um, that is going to happen in terms of the bad discourse on autism. That's going to happen. It's still a generation or two away, but be part of the first wave. Perhaps time for one more question. It's 4.57, Nick, so it'll be a quick one. Okay. All right. <laughs> one question then. Um, does the neurodiversity paradigm include ADHD or is it primarily concerned with autism? The neurodiversity paradigm says that uh, is, is a framework that looks at neurodiversity and says uh, we are a neurodiverse species and uh, there is no one normal or natural way for a human mind to function, just like there's no natural or normal culture or natural or normal ethnicity or natural or normal gender. And that's the neurodiversity paradigm right there. So it concerns itself with all human neurodiversity and every single human being with no exception as part of the spectrum of neurodiversity. You can't be outside of it. If you have a central nervous system, you're part of the spectrum of human neurodiversity. So uh, uh, if the question is, is this included in the neurodiversity paradigm in some way? If you're talking about human beings with central nervous systems, the answer is always yes. Thank you so much. It's so hard to wrap it up because we have so many questions and we want to end with a huge thank you to Dr. Nick Walker for this amazing and thought provoking talk. Uh, we're just beginning to embark on a student neurodiversity scholars group. Uh, working with your book. So look for Rowan Announcer, those of you who are Rowan students, to engage in that work. We've put um, Nick's book, Nor Queer Heresies, in the chat as well as website. And feel free to engage in those. Maybe we can pop them in the chat one last time. And then I just want to say to also um, consider some of our upcoming talks, and we'll put those links in the chat as well. I know that everyone would like to give a wholehearted Thank you. So I'm trying to quickly allow people to unmute if they would like to say thanks as they log off. Thank thanks you all. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for great presentation. Nick. Thank you. Thank you very it was much. Wonderful. Thanks. Was thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, thank you so much, uh, Amy, for putting this together. Thank you, Annie and Terry, for uh, yes. facilitating this Q and A. Thank yes, you, Esther. Thank you, yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you. We may need to do round two. <laughs> I I'm up for it. I'm, okay, great. I'm, I, I would do a round two. This was this was terrific. Yes. I think all right. For it already. Terrific. Thank you, so, thank you much. so much. Looking forward to round two. <laughs> all right. <laughs>